All right, thank you for staying with us so far on Good Morning Nigeria. And to kick off the second part of our conversation on local government autonomy, let's take an uh, uh, excerpt cut out for us by correspondent Ekene Ndolwe. It appears to me that governors of all the political parties appears to be political emperors hmm. in their respective states. So much so that when you see even uh, what appears to be local government election, no other political party can win even a councillor seat. It's only an infinitesimal number of places that you can see that. Most of the states in Nigeria legislate against Segu 4 of the Constitution. All the collectible of local government have been adjourned. Number one, the issue of advertisement. State government has created signage agents to seal the revenue of local government. In motor parks and garages, all the states in Nigeria have adjourned the collection of rates and taxes at motor park. Let there be uniformity in the conduct of local government elections across the country, whereby one independent body should conduct the election. And there should be uniformity in tenure, just like what the uh, president and the governors are enjoying. Let it be four years. One of the things that we must emphasize is that unless we strengthen accountability mechanisms at the local government level, even if you ensure that by reason of financial autonomy, all the resources that are due to the local governments from the Federation account should go directly to the local governments. If we don't strengthen accountability mechanisms, we are going to end up with a cesspool of corruption. So it is not enough to engender autonomy, whether administrative or financial, we must of necessity make sure that the accountability mechanisms at the local government are strengthened so that at the end of the day, whatever funds are due to the local governments are prudently utilized for the benefit of the vast majority of the people that live at the grassroots. Yeah, thank you, Ekene, for that uh, background um, um, excerpt from yesterday's discussion. Now, to continue the discussion on local government uh, autonomy, we have in the studio our guest for today. And joining us is uh, Dame Pauline Tallinn. She is the immediate past Minister of Women Affairs and former local government chairman in oh. Plateau State. I was councillor. I was oh, not chairman. No, you were cancelled. I contested chairmanship, but the Abashaku okay. uh, so disrupted it. it. Yes. So you, you were councillor? I was councillor twice. Twice. Yes. So and then I contested, that. but you the Abashaku nullified, nullified it. Nullified it. Anyway, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for that correction. Yeah. So we make that adjustment. Yes. And also in the studio, we have the. Jibril Sabo Kiana, former chairman, Kiana Local Government Area Council, Nazarawa State. You're welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you, and good morning, Nigeria. Good. All right, and from Joss, we have been joined yet again by Professor Darkas, CJ Darkas. He joined us yesterday. Uh, he is a senior advocate of Nigeria and professor of comparative constitutional law, international law, and jurisprudence. He's also a former Attorney General of Plateau State, lead consultant to the Ninth House of Representatives Special Committee on Constitution Review. It's a pleasure to have you once again, Prof. Thank you very much. Good morning, Nigeria. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for joining us. So let's, let's kickstart our conversation this morning. I'm going to start with the former chairman. Uh, that's Kiana. Uh, we, we, we laid the foundation of what the Constitution says concerning the autonomy of local government in Nigeria yesterday and from the excerpt that you, you saw there. So 
we want to find out what exactly are the roles and responsibilities of uh, local government under the existing constitutional framework. Uh, good morning, Nigerians. Um, I will crave your indulgence to maybe start by really appreciating Mr. President and praying that uh, he will be the modern St. Paul of Nigeria because uh, his antecedents when he was the governor of uh, Lagos State was quite opposite of what he's uh, trying to save Nigeria from now. He was one of the first governors that created development areas and practically brought the autonomy of local government into dispute. And so it was a very pleasant surprise and very gladdening uh, that he's at the forefront today through his the, through the instruments, instrumentality of his uh, attorney general to now refocus the status of local government into the discuss for the country and he's seen it from the perspective that it may really be the solution to the endemic problems that has uh, engulfed the country from the point of development security and all sort of things so i'm sure by the time he's finishing his tenure we'll be calling him tinubu ahmed Bola St. Paul of <laughs> Nigeria. So uh, with that, I'd like to say that um, the schedules of the local government uh, council in this country represents the totality of the activities that are made up of the daily living needs of the people at the local government area or wherever else you reside. Because indeed, every part of the country is residual to the local government Council. So all activities that you know are uh, encompassing your daily needs from your taxes, the maintenance of your roads, your refuse collection, your health uh, management, your educational, local education management, are all the prime schedules of the local government system. I just got the uh, snipes from the last uh, yesterday's speaker that advertisement, <coughs> the uh, the, the collection of, uh, of uh, taxes in the park, in the market, the sewage management, everything else is contained in Schedule 4 and it's very clear, very distinctive. The, government, the state governors have just usurped all these daily activities of the local government system by stripping them of their funding and so it has rendered the system inept for the purpose which it was created for. And so you can see that the local government system is the government for the people at their point of need and a point of residence. Everything else that you see that local government don't do today has been taken over by the governor, or by, by the uh, second tier of government, let me call it this time, uh, this way. So it is, it is the loss of the country, really. Because, and I keep, you know, the emphasis has always been about funding, funding, or loss of funding to the local government system. No, it is the loss of the political development of the people, of the country. Because once there is nothing happening in the local government system, political development does not take place. We lose everything else by having an unstable local government system in this country. The development of the political profile of uh, individuals and the development of political ideology of the individuals are lost. Because everything is stopped and done in the government house at the state today. So the loss is more colossal than really than the schedules, the daily schedules we talk about. Because it's becoming like a ringtone for the country now, funding and then the loss of their, of their not allowing the local government people to do that. No, it's the loss of us, the politicians, because we practically have nothing to do. You can't influence elections, you can't encourage emergence of candidates, you can't encourage the propaganda of activity, political activities or agenda or anything that you had, want to do, because everything is assumed and in fact assumed to the government house. So the idea is that the, the loss of, uh, of, of uh, the local government system functioning properly, you know, it transcends the daily needs we keep talking about on, 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 on about the constitutional provisions of the, of, of the country. It is even worse mm. because when the human capital is not developed, the mindset is not developed to, gain, to know his responsibilities every four years, uh, every, four, every political cycle, is a greater loss than inact the, the inactivity of the local government council. Because the local government uh, officials, how many are they in the, in the state or in the local government area? And what do they do that you don't do yourself? But when you don't have the enabling environment, the laws, the capacity, to you know, have an authority within you which you can influence, definitely then you have a problem coming more than the daily needs of uh, the local government activities that are supposed to be carrying out. Okay, L let me, just for the purpose of um, 
having a proper understanding mm. of when local governments became like this. Because growing up in Lagos, I remember that a local government chairman, then soon later a local government chairman, the first actually mm -hmm. chairman was elected from my neighborhood, from the streets where I grew up. And um, I know that he was able to tar the roads. We saw the road start for the first time. I could remember vividly how that road became at that time, an untarred road, but now paved and tarred for us as well as other you know, streets so, around. Mm -hmm. Has it always been like this? At what time were you chairman? And um, was it always like this? Was it practice in truth? And maybe it will help if we also compare notes with yeah. uh, them Pauline Talent yeah. later when you are done. Maybe yeah. she will also share her own experience. No, for my personal experiences, I have always maintained this house that um, I had a very noble experience because it gave me the opportunity to demonstrate that the government of the people at the local government is the most effective and useful tool for people's uh, accomplishment of their daily uh, needs. When I was a local government chairman, and with due respect and truthful to uh, Abla, Governor uh, Abla Adamu, he was my, I, I was chairman between 1999 and 2003. Throughout our tenure, he never touched, nor instructed, nor got involved in our funding. All our payments were done strictly to our individual local government accounts. And so there was significant evidence that the funding that went to the local government councils were put into the needs of the development I mean, of the local government area. In my case, and that's what is standing me today, you know, politically, so to say, because it is, it is on record, really, that my three years as a local government chairman in Kenya has a standing record. With due respect and with all humility, I'm saying this for the purposes of the question that you have asked, mm -hmm. that it is during my tenure that the council had its name rebranded, rebranded as a developing area, as a, as a unique area to come and see, imagine democracy growing in true sense of it. Mm -hmm. Because I can remember that for 50 to 60 to 70 percent of most of the delegates that come from outside this country that uh, the then uh, president wanted to see democracy in action, this, he sends them to Nasara State and immediately arriving at the government house after they cut this, they send them to Kiana, local government, to come and see what democracy is doing at the various, uh, for the various activities we're engaged in. Mm -hmm. And the thrust of my engagement was getting the people to own the government. And so I, I, I engaged in a very massive uh, enlightenment program for people to know that this thing is residual in them. And because if you don't make them to know that the programs you are, you are bringing to them is their own, you can build houses, you can build infrastructure, they will not oh, own it and that's the end of it. And so we were able to lay the foundation of even creating uh, world development areas and build offices that, uh, offices that are meant for every ward. And the, the, the leadership of such wards are not made of political parties. They are made up of the stakeholders of the ward, made of a chairman and a secretary, a woman member and a youth member, and the secretary was posted from the council. And these halls were built by the people themselves. They were mobilized to the extent they were able to build their, their ward centers. If you go to every ward in Canada today, those ward centers have been uh, used for film houses, for, uh, for clinics, and so on and so forth. Fundamentally, that was the taking point for me but also to provide infrastructures. We constructed roads, we constructed uh, <coughs> the Secretariat that stands out as one of the, the most famous today in this country. We created, we were able to institutionalize what you call liaison office for the state, for the government, uh, for the local government. Because of the nature of the road then, we initiated a liaison office in Lafia so that maybe you make your preliminary request before you go in because Canada then was on the, on the highlight of uh, mineral endowment. And so there were so many inquiries that were coming in, so we had to open a liaison office in Lafia, in, uh, in Lafia for that. And we, 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 re we brought in, water, we, re we renovated water projects, the health centers, and all the youth were involved in at one level of activities or the other. If there was any project that we, can, we, we were undertaking, it was the youth and the stakeholders that initiated them. Because before I even went into the activities, we had a summit of all the stakeholders, regardless of the party, for three days. And every community identified what was their priorities. And each of those priorities, I can say for 80% for the tenure I had, were executed. So it's, the people were alive. People came to understand that they now are part of a government. They, they cared less what was happening in the state. They cared less what was happening at the federal government. And so the issues of body, I mean, of youth in uh, restiveness was minimized. 
uh, because we had all, the, all these things that uh, be, had become the nucleus of activities today, uh, small, small loans be given to people to buy uh, kits for fixing tires for motorcycles, kits for repairing tires for mm -hmm. trucks, for the machines, for, gener for generators. And during my tenure, the, the Japanese-Nigerian program was coming alive, and so there was the uh, idea that light was coming to Kiana. So we were even ahead. We started recruiting people to train them for repairing of uh, gens, uh, fridges, and uh, electricity, I mean, uh, lightning and lining up of uh, the, the houses and so on and so forth. So it was very full and very active and very okay. engaging. And so because my funding was freely flowing to us, it was my responsibility to ensure that it was deployed to the areas of the immediate needs of my people and it was reflective in their association and support that they gave me throughout my channel. Okay, okay. thank you very much, uh, yeah. uh, Ken. Mm. Now let's, let's come to the former immediate past uh, uh, Minister for Women Affairs and uh, also a former councillor twice. Yes. Now let's, let's get your own your experience yes, as a yes, councillor. Yes. You know, what were the challenges, you know, faced by the local government. Thank you very much and good morning Nigerians. Uh, mine is a little bit uh, different from, from his, his own case okay. but not quite different because my uh, councillorship was during the military mm, no. under Abacha. So uh, when uh, not under Abacha, under um, IBB Okay. when the former late first lady ensured that there must be an active woman mobilizer within the local government as a member of the management committee. Okay. You remember there was a decree where the uh, management committee was comprised of uh, members of the management committee with a woman. So there was one woman in all the 774 local government across the country to give us a sense of uh, belonging okay. and I happen to be the beneficiary that time. Uh, I want to start by commending uh, President Ahmed Bolak Tinubu and all well-meaning Nigerians who have been upholding his efforts towards uh, local government autonomy. We pray it works out and that will be the beginning of uh, genuine development because when you uh, talk about local government, uh, government at the local government level, it's the government of the people by the people. It's the government closest to the people because uh, most people in the rural areas don't even care about what is happening at the federal. They don't bother about the, who is the president or the governor. Mm -hmm. What concerns them is the government closest to them. And once it's working, we have development at the grassroots. It's like a building without a good foundation. That building cannot stand. So I can describe a local government administration as the foundation of national development. And I must uh, commend my military administrator that I uh, work with, but as councillors and commissioner. As councillor, we saw clearly that the military administrator during our time, it was uh, Chris, late Chris Ali, mm -hmm. he did not interfere with the funds at the local government. But he closely monitors what is happening at the local government. And I remember vividly the problem within my <coughs> local uh, constituency. We had a drainage problem. Mm -hmm. And I took it up with my chairman of the management committee and I was able to construct a good drainage system uh, from the heart of the town right to the end of uh, the local government headquarters and also district a areas. That really gave uh, the people a sense of uh, belonging, a sense of joy and it made me really really popular as their counselor and that was the beginning of what put pressure on uh, my husband to allow me pick the form to contest chairmanship uh, election when the uh, ban on politics was lifted during the SDP 
and NRC, and I contested it under the SDP. So these are things that if local government have their autonomy, there will be genuine development. Mm -hmm. But again, the concerns of everyone is accountability, as mm -hmm. uh, Professor Dakar says. The uh, governors should be fair enough to allow their funds go and now if it comes directly from the okay. federation account set, all that the uh, governors need to do is to monitor and ensure that they task the local government to judiciously use their funds well if that is done then we will have more development more better development sense of belonging and it will also cope rural uh, urban migration because if things are working in the in your local government you don't need to move away and go, come to the city. So that is an is issue where we will have our youths fully engaged in farming, we'll have our youths fully engaged in activities within the local government. And that will help genuine development from the local government. And if the states do their own, it grows to the federal level. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. It must have been uh, nostalgic for both of you to share these experiences of uh, many years ago. Uh, but let's bring uh, Professor Dakas into this conversation. Um, you've listened to the guests in the studio, and uh, yesterday you were trying to prefer solutions to what we have now, because it means that what we have at the moment, the travesty that we have as local government administration today, began at some point. It wasn't there from the very beginning. Uh, and so what do you think? You alluded yesterday uh, to the need for, after all of these fights, to ensure proper autonomy, and we get the funds to the local governments to ensure accountability. Do we have the mechanisms for governors to hold local government uh, administrators or chairmen accountable? Or is it the people? that we hold them accountable. What are the other solutions that you prefer to ensure that we get it right going forward? Thank you very much. Uh, permit me to first of all uh, make a few remarks regarding the fact that Dame Pauline Talen started out in terms of her political career as a councillor. I think I now understand the context in which her life has essentially been one of service from councillor to commissioner, to deputy governor, to a two-term minister. Uh, for me, coming from Plateau State, I think that this is um, really delight, uh, delightful news to understand the context in which she has devoted her life to service of the people. And listening to the former chairman of Kiana Local Government Area, it gives you a sense of the possibilities in terms of the transformative impact of local governments if they are allowed to work in a manner that is fit for purpose. Which then brings me to the point that you raised about the imperative to engender accountability mechanisms, because this is extremely critical. As we pointed out yesterday, you can amend the constitution to provide that funds due to local governments are transmitted directly to the local governments. But if you don't have accountability mechanisms, then, as I pointed out yesterday, you're going to create a cesspool of corruption. And the purpose would be defeated. It then becomes counterproductive. Yesterday, I alluded to part of the effort being made by the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, the NFIU. And what the NFIU has done is to require, for instance, that under no circumstance should a local government transact business in excess of 5 million naira in cash in a day. And part of the reason why you find a great deal of corruption is where you don't find the paper trail. And so if electronic transactions become the order of the day, then there's a sense in which this limits the opportunities for uh, corrupt enrichment at the local government level. So what the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit has done is one of those mechanisms. Now, if you look at the law establishing the Economic and Finance, Financial Crimes Commission, as well as the Anti-Corruption Agency, the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission, you will find that their mandate also extends to the local governments. 
And so there are a number of institutions whose mandate is consistent with the imperative need to ensure that there is good governance at the local government level and financial accountability. But at the end of the day, there is only so much that these anti-corruption bodies can do. The, it is imperative that we put in place mechanisms that empower the people to hold their leaders accountable. Part of the reason why impunity festers, even in the context of financial mismanagement, is lack of accountability. If you do something wrong and you know that there are consequences, the likelihood is that you are unlikely to do that thing unless you have become a recidivist. So the people need to realize that government funds are their own funds, that they have what it takes to hold the people accountable, which means we need to build capacity at the local government level. We need to build capacity at the level of the electorate because if people also know that there are consequences for lack of good governance, they know that the people can hold them to account at the next general elections and that people are going to vote not on the basis of ethnicity and other primordial sentiments, then people will indeed realize that it is important to be focused, to deliver on your mandate, and to earn the confidence of the people. I believe that there are a number of things that we can do, but ultimately, as I pointed out yesterday, the vast majority of our people stay at the grassroots level. And as then Pauline Talent pointed out, local governments are the foundation of governance. They are the front lines of governance. And it's important that we do everything we can to ensure that we're able to deliver on the mandate of local governments in a manner that is fit for purpose, in a manner that inspires confidence in the local government system, which in turn will hopefully inspire confidence in democracy in our country, especially the backdrop of the fact that we celebrated 25 years of unbroken democratic rule in this country. And we need to sure that democracy reveals the desired uh, dividends for the vast majority of our people. Thank, thank you, uh, Professor Dakas, uh, SAN, for your opening remarks. Okay, you want to add? Okay. Now, upgrade what he, he was trying to allude into. Okay. You see, b because the local government system has not been allowed to function, people don't know that the level of check and balances that exist in the federal government, in the state government, also, also exists, exists in the local government system. Each of the years that I was a local government chairman, I presented my budget, which was approved by my legislative house, which means we had a speaker, we had council, council, which was the, 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 the legislative arm of government mm -hmm. for the local government. And each of those years, I put, presented my budget that was approved by the house. That's number one. Number two, there was the, this uh, directorate for uh, uh, enlightenment, uh, NOA, mm -hmm. that for each of those years, the then director of uh, uh, NOA in Nasara State had a program that she engaged each local government into public discuss round, round the year. And every local government chairman, and I was, let me speak for myself, mm. always presented to my people and they asked questions on how their funds were being utilized. Mm. But these institutions were not allowed to function because it came to a point where the local government system was no longer functioning. Number two, you wouldn't believe it that the most conscious population in this, in this country that we have are the people that reside in the local government areas. Once they are told that they have responsibility to discharge, you will be shocked at how many local government chairmen, so to say, will be chased out of their offices and they will never come back. Because if there is enough publicity on the funds that have been brought in, if there is no publicity on the program they have agreed that will take place during the schedule or during the time frame of a local government chairman, and it's not being done, mm. the youth are so restive. Because, you know, it is not the responsibility of local government today that there are so many graduates that are robbing the street. So the, the local government is already made of very vibrant, vibrant, enlightened young men mm. that know that you are supposed to do this or supposed to do that. But they have not been encouraged to develop even to how to discharge their responsibility to themselves. 
So the local government is more equipped, more endowed to really checkmate the activities of those who are responsible. If there is any right anywhere, it is the local government people that start it, really. And secondly, the aspect that we didn't discuss is the security aspect, that it was also the responsibility of the local government chairman or institution to give weekly reports or daily report first and foremost in liaison with his meeting with his DPO mm. in consultation with the chief tenancy institution that that report is transmitted to the state commissioner. And so most of these things, this banditry stuff, and it was also the responsibility of the local government to superintend over the activities of the forest and forest act uh, economic oh, activities. Yeah. So it is very easy, and it was also part of our schedule. I used to conduct night races on the route. We, I man route where lumbers were being transported in the night, and we seize them and take them back to local government areas. So the local government is so equipped that the <coughs> banditry activities that uh, the, the forest that harbors the bandits today would have been consistently under the check of the local government forest officers that also have a team of, uh, of, of security people attached to them. So there will be no much room for people to go and hide there and launch attacks on the road or on the populace. The activities, the funding that comes to the local government system is checkmated by the activities of both the local government House of Assembly and the provisions of Section 7 that is already uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the constitution because positively minded a uh, state governor will ensure that the House of Assembly passes laws that will encourage the proper utilization of funds and monitors the, the budget uh, execution of the local government area, not to strangulate them. And because also the state government will be also making her own financial input, because every 10% temp, temp of the total income of, a local of, of the state mm. is supposed to be you know, part of the funding that goes to the local government every month. And so with the mechanism of the state houses of assembly by laws, I mean laws, and the bylaws that the local government houses of, uh, I mean, their own uh, legislative arm will do, and the mobilized, uh, highly mobilized populace, and the directorate of uh, uh, NOA, National Orientation Agency, are all focused. That's, that's where the activity is going. Every market day. You understand me? So if the local government is, is, is allowed to sprout, like Her Excellency said, Anything that you will not believe will happen in Nigeria will be like a momentous growth for political activities, for economic activities, for everybody to have a sense of belonging in this country. Okay. And so, so most of these activities are already in place. It's just that we are not allowed them to take place and begin to function as it were. Thank you very much, uh, Kiana, for mm. that uh, addition there. Let, 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 let's bring in uh, David Pauline Talent again. You, you, you stated that it's obvious, actually, because if there is no foundation, there's nothing you can build any you know, structure on. And the local government is supposed to be the bedrock of development in this country. Yeah. But why is it that the state's government, you've been deputy governor, you've been a commissioner. Why do you think actually that the state you know, government are taking over the responsibility of the local government? Because it's, it's really... Um, it's staggering because, I mean, you want to find out that because, you know, that is where the development comes from. Mm -hmm. From what he said, mm -hmm. if you want security, start from the local government. Yeah. If you want education, start from the local yeah. government. Health, start from the local government. Mm -hmm. So why are you trying to, what, what is the problem actually? Thank you very much. It is sad to note that governors usurp the powers of the local government by uh, taking over their funds. It is unfortunate because, in the first place, a good governor, if you have the fear of God mm. and you are there to govern, to serve your people, because the people voted you in to serve them, and service must entail the fear of God and doing that which is right. If you are genuinely there as an elected governor, your prayer is to see that 
you ensure the dividends of the democracy reaches the people. But where they usurp this power and strangulate the local governments, nothing happens. The problem of kidnapping, the problem of uh, having bandits in the forest, is all because the local governments have in the top of their power. Even if security. forest guards, yes, security-wise, forest guards, if they are allowed to do their work, fully supported, engage the youths, because the youths in every community are the vanguards. If the youths are carried along, mm -hmm. if the women are carried along, because the women and the youths, they are the heart of the nation yeah. because mothers are concerned about what is happening within the family. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you talk of development, it starts from the home. The home, the community, the society, and the local government at large. So if I give an example of my tenure as a councillor. Before I was even uh, nominated as a councillor, I was the first woman, woman that mobilized women within the local government to form the National Council of Women's Society by creating awareness in women that they must serve, they must be part of what is happening within their community. Mm. You must be concerned about what is happening within your neighborhood, the uh, hospital, the, uh, that time the uh, post office was working where these are uh, areas where social activities, things that affect the community, the hospital, the roads to the hospital, when, when the grass uh, grows and or people pour the refuse to block the road, I mobilize women for us to come out, clear the roads, go in within the hospitals, clean the environment so that uh, people that come to stay with their relations in the hospital will have a safe place to stay with it. Things that when uh, those communities or those institutions cannot do, the community do it. So we create awareness in women and youths. And we also involve the traditional rulers because before you get the women to leave the marketplace to come and do this uh, community service, you must engage the community uh, leaders. That's the traditional rulers, the ward heads, to allow the town crier to announce that on so so day, there is going to be a community development uh, assignment for people to go out. When you get people fully in involved in the day to day activities of their community, they will checkmate what is happening. And that was why my tenure as councillor, the first tenure, was quite. Uh, controversial because I was like a watchdog mm. to the mismanagement of funds okay. to the point that my chairman reported me that I was uh, giving him problems. So you had checks and balances? Yes, okay. because the councillors, the members of the management committee were like councillors and I made it a point of duty to checkmate, to find out what comes in and how it is used. So by the time I was reported to the uh, state government, the commissioner for local government. I was invited by the military administration and I opened up and I said everything. And I was protected because security report proved me right at the local government. And that was what led to my being reappointed the second time when uh, Onoja came back as a, uh, came in as a military administrator. I served under two military administrators because I stood for the people, I was the voice of the people, and I made sure that what was meant for uh, the, the local government <clears throat> was properly utilized. Okay. The same thing, I had the same experience when I served on, uh, as commissioner, I, I again served twice under Colonel Mana, who was also very, very committed and strict to ensure that Local government uh, management committee were properly tasked and monitored. He set targets and we followed closely. So elected governors can do it. All you need to do is allow them perform, 
monitor, set targets for them, and let the people be involved in what concerns them. That's the need assess assessment. You should have community town hall meetings with the people, discuss which are your priority. Is it the state government that you set target for them, uh, for the local government? Would, would, wouldn't that be interference? No. Not the, uh, I mean, during the military. Uh -huh. But what I'm saying because, that because if now, they should set targets, yes, it means they will be interfering. No, they don't the interfere because the, the funds governments. are not with them. But the community mm -hmm. will set targets. Yes. The, the uh, councillors at the local government should also be the voice of the people because they should be able to, from time to time, have community uh, engagement with the people. And within this community, these are our priorities. Either we want uh, boreholes or uh, our schools renovated, our schools equipped, uh, healthcare services. Uh, on what within, basis uh, they will also be assessed. Assessed. Uh, but, but let me stay with you. I understand that you have just a few minutes to spend with us. Okay. So let me stick with you. What are the likely political implications yes. of having a functional uh, local government system? It serves us well that you have served at that level, yeah. you have served at the state, state level, you have also held office at the federal level. What are the political implications? Apart from the money, what do you think are the concerns of state governors? The concerns of state governors should be good governors. Ideally, a good governor should be concerned with giving the dividends of democracy to his people. And if you are given the uh, dividends of democracy to your people, it speaks for you. Sometimes I wonder why people <coughs> become so greedy, they believe in just uh, usurping money. But good works will speak for you. If you are concerned with delivering the dividends of democracy, you perform, you do what gladdens the hearts of your community, your second tenor will be a walkover because the people will want you to come back and continue the good work. People are aware of their rights. People know what is good and what they need within the, that community, both local government and states. And it doesn't cost you anything to do the right thing. When you do the right thing, in fact, you benefit more. You become more popular. The people will pray for you. And the words of uh, Prayer. The people, prayers of the people mm. works because when people keep cursing you, raining insults on you, it will affect you even if it doesn't affect, mm. it will affect right through. The so next. what are the political implications of the, having a functional local government system? The political implication is that there will be de development, mm -hmm. the people will be happy, there will be peace mm -hmm. and security because where you see problems arising here and there is because there's this affection. Okay. When people are happy, they will be part of that government. Okay. When people are happy, they will be the watchdog. They will identify and report All right. okay. things that are not right within the community. Because the, our ward heads, our community leaders know the bandits, know strangers when they come in. But if everybody is happy with what you are doing, the implication is that there will be good governance, there will be peace, things will flourish, and the people will be happy. Thank you very much, uh, Dem Pish. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> the Pauline Talent for mm. your uh, thoughts there. Now let's go back to our Zoom guest, Professor Dakas, SAN. Let's uh, bring you into the conversation again. Let's consider what happens in other climes where we're talking about local government autonomy. How do they run their own local government and what can we borrow from other clients in order for us to have a functional and workable local government in this country? Thank you very much. Um, I take, for instance, the example of the United States that I'm familiar with. And in the United States system, you find that governance devolves to the lowest levels. And if you take, for instance, the subject of policing, which is part of the conversation that transpired yesterday, you find that policing goes all the way to even the campus police. At the university where I did my postgraduate studies in New York, we had the campus police. 
And so you have responsibilities devolving to the lowest levels. But in the United States, for instance, unlike what happens in this country, where you have, where, uh, as somebody would say, feeding bottle federalism, you have to go to the federation account to get funds. In the U.S. system, there is no such feeding bottle federalism. You have to raise your funds and use the funds to sustain yourself. And so when you look at uh, the fourth schedule to the Constitution, which sets out the functions of local governments, if local governments are allowed to optimally exercise those roles, at the end of the day, that, those are the mechanisms through which they can generate the funds. And they will invariably have to be prudent in the management of the funds, because if they don't, and along with the taxes that they collect, if they don't raise sufficient funds to sustain the local governments, then they eventually become bankrupt. If you have followed developments in the United States, there are a number of municipalities um, and mayoralties that have actually been declared bankrupt. So if you have a situation in which people realize that the manner in which they manage the resources the manner in which they provide services for their people will ultimately determine their viability, then people will sit up. Ask yourself, except for our feeding bottle federalism, there are many of our states and local governments that should ordinarily be self-sustaining, that should ordinarily be viable. But if you look at the statistics, apart from Lagos, Ogun, Rivers, probably Kano, Delta, who uh, maybe Aquabon, if others, many of the states as they stand today are not even viable. I, I, I think we seem to have lost him there, maybe due to network. Okay, he's back. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just making the point that part of what we need to do is to address this feeding bottle federalism that we grapple with. Let us look inward. Let us explore ways through which we can ensure that our states are viable. If you take Plateau State, for instance, if we leverage tourism, if we leverage our weather, if we leverage our agriculture and other dynamics, there's absolutely no reason why we cannot be viable. And the same is true of many other states. One of Nigeria is one of the most endowed countries in the world. But Hillary Clinton made a very profound statement that Nigeria is too rich to be poor and yet too poor to be rich. That's the kind of paradox that we are confronted with. And so part of the responsibility of governance to come back to the role of local governments and how this plays out in other climes is to make sure that consistent with the fact that they are the bedrock they are the foundation of governance. If we so impact will be more readily by the people, the people can breathe, and they will appreciate our democracy in a very profound way, which will in turn have ripple effects in terms of advancing the cause of democracy at other tiers of government. And so we need to really take a second look at the local government system in a more profound manner that will deliver the dividends of democracy for the people beyond the system that we have at the moment. With you, Professor Darkas, please. Um, now, at the moment, what we have is that the federal government has gone to court and the state governments have met them there. You know, like when you say to somebody, meet me in court. And... Uh, where do you see all of this being resolved and how do we make progress from there? Is there a likely political solution to this instead of going through the courts? First of all, Mr. President, as well as the Attorney General of the Federation for taking that initiative to go to court. And to court through the instrumentality of the office against the state attorneys general. It then enables the uh, attorney general federation to invoke the 
the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And once that happens, then there's a likelihood that the matter gets addressed within a very short period of time. If this matter were to go before uh, a federal high court or a state high court, the likelihood is that in the next five, ten years, the matter is not re resolved. And if you have followed the developments that are unfolding, many of the states have raised objections to the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in this matter. They're insisting that the matter should go through the entire gamut of coming up from the High Court to the Supreme Court. And you know that takes almost an eternity. But if the Supreme Court comes to the conclusion that this is the right circumstance under which its original jurisdiction can be invoked, then you can be sure that perhaps um, in a month or less, the Supreme Court would make a definitive pronouncement on the subject. And indeed, regarding the constitutionality of the uh, caretaker committees, the Supreme Court has made that very clear from Ekiti to Oyo and a number of other states. Where we are likely to have a sticky point is whether if you have transition committees or caretaker committees, the funds that are due to local governments should not be released to those caretaker committees. That might be one aspect of it. But ultimately, beyond the intervention of the judiciary is the political solution. And I'm delighted that Mr. President is leading from the front in this respect. And in, in the American system, there is what is called the power of the uh, uh, bully pulpit. Not necessarily that Mr. President is going to bully the state, but that Mr. President can leverage the power of his office to ensure that he leads from the front to push this agenda forward. That's one political dimension. But the other dimension is to come back to constitutional amendment, as I pointed out yesterday. If you look at the dynamics, at this point, the majority of states are not on board. Now, what do we need to do to get these states on board? Beyond what Mr. President can do, can we look at the dynamics at play? To give you an example, if you look at the last constitutional amendment exercise, the governor of Bauchi State was in office. And I, I mentioned governor because, as you know, many governors wield considerable influence in their state houses of assembly. He was the governor in office. He has been re-elected. He is the chairman of the PDP Governors Forum. Can he be a partner in this journey to mobilize the governors elected on the platform of the PDP? The governor of Kwara State is the chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum. In the last constitutional amendment exercise, Kwara State is one of the states that did not make returns to the National Assembly. So we couldn't say at that point what the position of the Kwara State government was. But I read a statement recently credited to the governor, who has also been re-elected, that is for local government autonomy. So can we get the governor of Kwara State to mobilize his colleagues? If you look at the governor of Imo State, he is the governor of the progressive he is the chairman of the progressive governors forum and the last exercise imo state voted for uh, administrative autonomy i'm not sure either administrative autonomy or financial autonomy but didn't vote for the other for the other now can we get him to mobilize his colleagues at the moment the chairman of the conference of speakers is the Speaker of the Oyo State House of Assembly. Now, if we have a sense of how the Oyo State Governor is going to push this agenda forward, then we can be more constructive and strategic in terms of getting them on board. All right. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Daka Zesien, for providing some solutions to this issue of local government uh, autonomy. You're welcome back. You're still on to Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. And our conversation today is on local government autonomy. And we still have our guest in the studio. But um, one of our guests, uh, Dame uh, Pauline Talon, who will soon be leaving. But before you leave, I want to ask this question because you have served at both the local, state, and the federal levels. So how should coordination 
between different tiers of government be strengthened to enhance service delivery? Thank you very much. Um, before I answer that question, I want to uh, commend my dear brother, Professor Dakas, for bringing in the issue of the uh, food imposition federalism that we are practicing in Nigeria. It is really, really sad mm -hmm. because Nigeria is blessed beyond major in all facets of life, both human and natural resources. Every local government is blessed with a lot of natural resources that if we harness on that, we don't need to rely on uh, the federal allocation. We've seen it in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And it can be happen in any other state. Um, the problem we are having now, we are happy, and I thank God that God is using the president to fight for the autonomy of the local governments. My take on this is that all our state governors should key in if they are truly leaders that are elected by the people. Because when you talk of federation, the three tiers of government should be independent. <clears throat> the three tiers of government should be allowed to perform effectively. How do they perform effectively? If their funds are being strangulated at the state level, they become as beggars to the state governors, which is not the right thing. I want to lend my voice as mothers of the nation we are appealing mm -hmm. to our state governors to align with Mr. President on this issue for local government autonomy. But this matter should not be dragged too long. It is clear that funds meant for the local government should be given to them and they should be allowed to perform. We have civil society organizations at the local government that will checkmate. And the people with enough awareness, the people at the local government will rise against any chairman that doesn't effectively use these funds. The same thing at the state level. If the state level should use the funds that are meant for development within the states, so we should use and enhance the local resources we have. But at the local government, at the state level, encourage local industries to make sure that the blessings God has blessed us within our communities are properly harnessed to the benefit of the people. And if this is done <coughs> at local government, states, and the federal uh, level, things will go well. But the sincerity of purpose, the fear of God, the sincerity of purpose in ensuring that what belongs to, to the people goes to the people. That will bring peace. That will bring development. That will even make you, the governor or the chairman or the president, more popular because people are seeing mm. once things are done the right way, people will support you, people will bless you, and the country will flourish. Thank you very so much. So it doesn't cost anybody anything to do the right thing. Let us uh, fight corruption. Let us ensure that we do the right thing at the right time. And that everybody will be happy and better off for it. And we'll have a prosperous and a uh, developed country that we all dream and pray for. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, Dame Pauline Talent, immediate uh, Past Minister of Women Affairs and former uh, Councillors uh, Local mm -hmm. Government uh, twice <laughs> in part of state, a former Commissioner yes. and also Deputy a Governor. former Deputy Governor. Thank you so much for your contribution this morning. Thanks for coming on Good Morning Nigeria. <laughs> so we can I excuse you. Okay. All right, um, Victor, you want to ask uh, Professor Daka some questions? Well, we 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 have. Uh, Professor Dakas um, talking to us earlier about the, you know, the legal implications and uh, what could be done, whether legally 
or administratively or even politically. But I just want to take this as your parting shot and briefly too, um, what you think um, will happen to the need for centralized policies and all that given the quest for local government autonomy to be entrenched? How do you think we can balance all of them out? Thank you very much. Um, I think it is important uh, that we strengthen the local government system. As the chairman of Algon pointed out in the course of our conversation yesterday, if you have uniformity of tenure, for instance, um, it will help the level of address the challenge of arbitrariness and the pace at which quite a number of local governments are dissolved and, are, and the system essentially at the mercy of some of the governors. And I say some of the governors because it's not every governor that is actually to respect. There are a number of governors, few that they may be, that are living up to expectation of the imperative need to strengthen the local government system, but there are very few. Uh, and since this is my parting shot, I think that it is critical to underscore the fact that at the end of the day, quality of the process that throws up the people that eventually become elected officials at the local government levels is important. Therefore, we need the internal operations of political parties. We cannot allow a situation where both fathers determine who the candidates we cannot allow a situation where only the money backs determine who the candidates are. We have a situation where the state independent electoral commissions are independent only in name, because at the end of the day, if you have an election in which candidates of the ruling party at the state level emerge as councillors and as local government chairpersons, then clearly you already know that the quality of the individuals that will be tasked with responsibility to manage the local governments is fundamentally compromised and undermined. And therefore, that will have implications for accountability at the local government level. It will have implications for the quality of governance. So we need to also pay attention to the quality of the process that throws up our elected officials. And as the Pauline Talent pointed out a few minutes ago, civil society needs to be engaged in a very profound manner with the government. Finally, the national president of Nolge was part of the conversation yesterday. Now, it's not states that are in default. Is Nolge the members of the State House of Assembly that are against is Nolge galvanizing and mobilizing its members to make sure that such individuals are not re-elected? Because ultimately, politics is likely to determine the outcome of what transpires. All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Dakas, I say, and for your contribution there. We are still coming to you for your second parting shots. This is the first parting shot. So we may still have to come to you, so don't leave yet. But let's come back to the studio uh, where we have Kena. Uh, you have listened to the uh, various uh, uh, suggestions, uh, both from the uh, 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 Pauline Talon and also from Professor Dakers, the issue of accountability, the issue of getting civil society engaged, and also the public also involved, you know, in uh, calling for accountability and you no, know. but. The issue is what mechanism, because you know the, the three tiers of government still have to work together. So what mechanism can foster collaboration while respecting the autonomy of local government? So thank you very much. Um, the discussions have continued to revolve around incidental elements yeah. of the problem. If we get back to the 1976 reform of the local government system, the focus is very clear on what the local government system can be. And it is because the reform, the spirit of the reform has not been carried along 
uh, in the course of the system that we've lost it all. The spirit of the reform in 1976 was that the local government system should be the government that every other person should be involved in, whether you are residual there or not. And that it should have been populated by like people who have almost retired and were bringing in their wealth of experiences back to the local setting so that they can groom new human capital to take over and move over in the course of their development. This is the spirit of the 1976 reform. By the time that the military intervened, there were sufficient physical regulations that you know, controlled activities of the local government. But now that we're in a democracy, there are so much self-sustaining regimes, I mean, uh, uh, laws and regulations that all these things we're talking about now are just because we're running away from the fact that the second tier of government mm. has usurped the political, the economic development of this country, consciously or unconsciously. And it is really, for me, the tier of government that should actually be called to question. Because the second tier of government, those made up of the governors, are the, uh, is the tier of government that has ridiculed our democracy. And I'm glad that history in the last 20 years has shown to us, gives me you know, satisfaction that all former governors are paying the prices for their misdemeanor when they were in the office. Because the governors when they're in office have flow, you know, continued to float this idea of federalism. Mm. It, is, it is in such a way that it's so quack, so unfounded, that they only give it the strength to make it convenient for them to usurp federal power and also the local government power. They don't allow the federal government to superintend over activities that are on concurrent list. Mm -hmm. they, they insulate the states from the local government to function, and then they hold on to everything, and at the end of the day, they're not doing anything to promote development in its, in its entire facet. Why I'm saying this is because if you look at the, the second tier of government today, it is the only inorganic structure we have. Because since the amalgamation in 1914, the two, the two uh, protectorates have become organic. And since the, the amalgamation, the local government systems have functioned under a different arrangement where the local people, the counties, then were you know, made up of people of honor in their respective domains. They were having their police, they were having their dispensary, they were having their court and their everything and security arrangements, just like uh, Professor was saying. So we left that and then jumped into a dramatic definition of federalism, mm -hmm. not knowing that the Nigerian version of federalism, it did not evolve. It's mechanically created. And because of the faces of the mechanical disruptions, we don't have a set rules of, a uh, set of experience that we have acquired in the course of time. And so anybody comes in now with his from uh, pro, uh, idea of federalism. The Nigerian federalism is a national federalism because 90% of the regulations of this country are, are packaged in the constitution by the federal, by the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. Every single rule you make in Nigeria translates to the local government. It's effective. That's national, for, national federalism. Mm -hmm. The kind of thing that the states have called Colmar reform cannot function here because we didn't have that background. And so if you have found ourselves where we are now, we should make the best use of what we have today. Mm -hmm. That the national federalism defines that we are all tiers of government. The several tier, the second tier, and the local government tier. If the second, the third tier of government, which is the local government, is allowed to function, the, the definitions of corruption that is continuously always a focus of uh, why local government are not allowed, is, is a runaway uh, uh, concern because uh, <laughs> let's remove the, the log in our eyes before we talk of the speck mm -hmm. in the other person's eye. Because corruption is more endemic with due respect to the federal government, the first year of government, because they have over 50% of the funds of this country. The second year has the next highest share of, of funds in the local of, of, of allocation, even though people like to call it as, uh, as feeding spoon stuff, uh, democracy. Let's discuss what we have. Let's not theorize. What we have now is what we have. Let's make use of the best things we have. What do you do when you have this kind of situation when people are not 
uh, taking responsibility for what they're supposed to be doing uh, on behalf of the people of this country. So if the local government system is allowed to function, mm. we will have okay. complete re-engineering of the Nigerian state mm. in a manner that people will be more attracted mm -hmm. to go and take political control of their local government. Mm -hmm. They will know that anybody coming to look for their votes will negotiate with the principal stakeholders. It's not for the governor to start, stand in his uh, state government office and determine who will be a senator, who is a house rep, who is a house assembly, who will be a councillor, who will be a chairman. That's what the, 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 the second tier of government has come. It has, become a, become a, it has become a, a soap to cool plotter. Mm -hmm. And because of this, they are disposition, they always forget to they'll be out of office after eight years. And they have become victims of what they have planted over the years. Indeed. So how would you now say a senator will have his, like, his political career determined by a governor? The president almost has his political career determined by, by a collection of governors. So something must be done to separate and limit the power of the second tier of government. Because they are the most mechanical link between the organic communities and what the Nigerian state has become as a national federalism. So if there is any tier of government that really, really, really needs to be questioned, it's the second tier of government, we need to checkmate it. And I think, you know, initially when the AG brought this case, took this case to Supreme Court, I had my reservations. Because the best approach to this is that we have enough people of, we have enough senators and House of Representatives who are victims of former governor's problems, former, former, former governor's interventions and machinations, and they are fearing also too that what's going to come out in 2007, that they would rather amend the constitutions fundamentally in the areas of election. I have always been for the national uh, local government election. The most important election in this country is the local government election. Mm -hmm. And it can be conducted. It was conducted in 1999. Yeah, and it, it brought us in. We br it, brought, it, it brought us in almost as independent candidates. Mm -hmm. You were going to be fielded by your party because you are going to be able to win an election against a contesting opponent. Mm -hmm. If we don't, if we concentrate on issue of funding and we don't bring in the, context, the, the, the element of uh, election, we will not get it right. Because you're sending many to a lekey of a governor who, who can put in anybody he wants. And he will still take the money from, through another means. Now, so now, yeah. now, now that you've talked about election, uh -huh. I just wanted there's an ongoing uh, conversation or debate uh -huh. around who should conduct local government elections. Yeah. Is it the CX that should continue to conduct it? In which case you have seen that every party in power at the state level determines who takes those seats, or should INEC be brought in? That discussion is ongoing. Where do you stand? My stand has always been that, like the FCT, you see the national, the INEC conducts the affairs of the local government elections in INEC. And you can see how interesting the elections in the FCT is. Very dynamic, very fluid, very people oriented. People make up their minds on what you do. You understand me? You have ex an SDP uh, uh, candidate winning election, you have a PDP governor, I mean chairman winning election, you have a PC uh, candidate winning elections. It's very, it's very mixed up and very, very active because there is a sufficiently independent organization that is not controlled by anybody conducting elections in FCT. If the National Electoral Commission is allowed to carry out the election in the local government system, we would have planted the seat for the new democratic setting at the local government areas of this country. It will, use, it will not put the local governors, I mean the governors, in their proper place. And they will know that they, they, will, they, will, they will not have the capacity to determine who will be the local government chairman. And so if you send money to that person who has been elected independently of the super influence of the governor, he will act to be able to, to sustain his goodwill with his people. But as long as we don't bring in the independent arrangement for the election of the local government system, for that long too, will the local government system continue to be an appendage of the state? Of the state. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, so, so, uh, oh, okay, yeah. just round up. Uh, just, just give me 30 seconds. Let's just get a parting shot. Okay. Uh, the final parting shot for Professor uh, Dakar's SAM on this uh, conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me underscore the imperative need for coordination and partnership among the different tiers and levels of government. As we was pointed out in the course of the conversation yesterday, if you have a tripod and one of the legs is faulty, then clearly uh, there is a major challenge that you have to grapple with. So the imperative need for coordination and partnership uh, is there. 
let me say very quickly on the case for uh, INEC to conduct local government elections. Uh, my view is that that's not the right way to go. Clearly, the state independent electoral commissions are in most respects independent only in name. But what we need to do, consistent with the need to strengthen our health system, is to find mechanisms through which we can strengthen the independent, the state independent electoral commissions. I give you one clear example. There was a local government election conducted during the tenure of uh, El Rufai as governor of Kaduna State, and they deployed technology in a manner that was constructive, and members of the opposition won elections in quite a number of constituencies. I understand that a similar, a similar thing played out in Kano State under Ibrahim Shekarao. And so it's not as hopeless as it is. It is possible to devise mechanisms through which we can strengthen the state independent electoral commissions. Let us not throw the baby away with the birth water. Let us not be in a hurry to throw every single challenge we have at the federal government or we send it to the center. I don't think that Thank, thank you, thank you for your, thank you for your view there, uh, Professor Dakas. Professor Dakas, C.J. Dakas, is a senior advocate of Nigeria, uh, professor of comparative constitutional law, international law, and jurisprudence. Thank you so much for your view on uh, this uh, local government autonomy. Thank you so much for coming. Also, we want to thank you, uh, um, uh, former chairman, Kiana Local Government. Uh, Jibril Sabo Kena, thank you so much for your uh, view this morning on local government uh, autonomy. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. You didn't allow me to conclude. But okay, conclude in 30 seconds. I wanted to say. <laughs> 30 you know, seconds, please. We don't have time. Yeah, that the local government, the federal and the local government system has transformed the federal government to be a federal government of palliatives, the state government of palliatives, local government of palliatives, the legislature house of come legislators of palliatives, palliatives across the country. Okay, thank you. So it's, Everything uh, of it's, palliatives. It's, yeah, it's, okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, there will still be other time yeah, sure. that you will still come on this okay. program and we will be able to exhaust everything. So that's Good Morning Nigeria for... Um, I am Ademola Adeo. Thanks for joining us and have a wonderful day. Right, and I'm Victor Azul. We'll see you again tomorrow. Mosaic of time in the kaleidoscope of life. Time is a masterpiece. A delicate piece when we wait. A vibrant shard when we're late. A dark fragment when we're sad. A radiant tile when we're happy. An intricate pattern when we're in pain. A long, winding thread when we're bored. But time's mosaic is crafted by our hearts and our minds, not by clocks. So piece together your time wisely.
This is the network service of the NDA.